I can say to each one of you, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. Instead, be reasonable. When Jonathan was in high school, he would kind of go off. We'd go, out to, we'd go out to lunch sometimes, and he'd go off, off on those, in his words, idiots who were working burger-flipping jobs just because they were, they were so stupid. That, that's all they could do. Not him. He loved to talk tech with me. He was going to do what I used to do. He wanted to do network design. And so he had registered in high school for all of the network design classes and the certification um, courses. Problem is, he didn't do any of the work. He never took, let alone passed, any of the certification exams. He talked about the startup companies and how he'd get people to come in who would just be begging to work for him. All talk, no walk. And the worst part, and I love Jonathan, the worst part was he actually believed his BS. He believed it. He really, really did. Now, when I was a kid, psychologists had found that people who thought highly of themselves generally performed better uh, and got into less trouble. So beginning back in the 1970s, parents, educators, politicians came to believe that by getting people to feel a sense of self-esteem, that was the key. Great inflation made low-achieving kids feel better about themselves. And I remember this starting when I was a kid. You got a participation, not just a ribbon, but a trophy <laughs> for everything. It was the age of the power of positive thinking. Preachers told congregations over and over about how special and unique you are in the eyes of God. Business leaders pushed the idea that everyone is exceptional and can be hugely successful. And it's not that any of those things is wrong. But it turns out that Feeling good about yourself doesn't really make you happy. Jonathan is now kind of coming to terms with the fact that he is working a burger flipping job and he's done that for a few years now. He smokes a lot of pot. I've stayed in touch with him off and on and I wouldn't call him happy. He's far from it. He struggled with depression, and there's a sense of shame in where he's at. We got sold this idea that happiness is mostly about feeling good, feeling positive. So we've been so messed up on this pursuit of happiness. You ask people what they want out of life. And it's almost a cliche, the answer you're going to get back. I want to be happy. I want to have a great family and a job that makes lots of money. That's the version of happiness that we've been sold. Everyone wants to be carefree. Have deep friendships, like those friendships that, that really matter. A soulmate for a spouse. Be great looking, rich, respected and admired. That's our Facebook life. The picture that some people try so desperately to paint of themselves. And it's BS. It's what we've been sold. It's the idol that we've been told to worship. It's that vision of a good life, of what it means to be happy. 
So I'm going to lay a little truth from Gandhi on you. There can be no true worship without sacrifice. Here are these words that begin the Ten Commandments. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You must have no other gods before me. Do not make an idol for yourself, no form whatsoever of anything in the sky above or the earth below or in the waters under the earth. What God knows about people is that we are idol-making machines. Whether you want to make the idol, you know, I don't worship an idol. Yeah, we all do. We create these false images. Maybe they're not something that you, that's physical, but we create these false images in our mind about what we're supposed to give our lives to. This messed up version of happiness has become an idol. And how do you know that you have an idol? It's really simple, actually, to know what your idols are if you're willing to be honest with yourself. It's what you sacrifice for. Most people want to have the prestige job and a boatload of money, but most people are not willing to suffer through the 60-hour work weeks, the business travel, and the bootlicking that goes into making it. Most people want to look great. I know about this, but aren't willing to eat so much less and hit the gym five or six days a week and get sore and sweaty. It's not fun. Most people want to have those awesome and deep relationships with other people. But they aren't willing to go through the hard conversations, the hurt feelings, the drama. And so they settle. And none of us, I don't care who you are, none of us can do it all. So we choose what we worship. We choose what and whom we are willing to sacrifice for. And I think that God maybe looks at us and sighs with sighs too deep for words. Over the next few weeks, I hope that you're going to be able to look honestly at yourself and confess your idols. Getting ready for this series, I had to do this myself. I'm going to tell you, it's, it's uncomfortable. I had to admit some things about myself that I didn't really necessarily like. And that's not fun. And perhaps you need to even involve God's spirit in guiding your choices, remembering that our God of grace continues to try to lead you out of slavery to the bondage to these idols, lead you out of that house of slavery. And it starts by dumping the BS about happiness. Karen's been married to Bob for decades. They've raised a couple of kids together. And in the time that I've known her, she's always seems, I've been looking for the word for this, she is disappointed in Bob, in their marriage. And it's true. They don't like doing the same things. She wants him to come home and for them to go out to plays and concerts together. And he wants to watch ESPN, a lot of ESPN. He doesn't care about plays or concerts. And she gets upset that he crashes on the couch. Now she sees other spouses going with their significant others to plays and concerts and wondered if she's with the right person, if her marriage is making her happy. We've been sold a vision of what a happy marriage is. We're supposed to marry our best friend, like all of the same things, and are inseparable. Now, 
when she and Bob are together, they talk. They, get, they like each other. They get along. They aren't mean to each other. This isn't an abusive relationship. But the metric that Karen chooses to use to evaluate her marriage is that Bob doesn't feel the same way about their leisure activities. Bob is not watching CNN to irritate her. He watches it because he likes it. They're just different people. So I recommended a counselor to her, and the advice that she got was transformative. What if she changed the metric of what a happy marriage is, what a happy marriage looks like? What if she allowed him to be the person he is and just chose to love the life that they have together? When she dumped the metric, that vision she had been sold of what a happy marriage is, magically she became happier. It was amazing. The same is true with our relationship with money. Money can certainly become an idol. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some have wandered away from their faith and impaled themselves with a lot of pain because they made money their goal. You get going and you get it into your mind that if you only made $80,000 a year, You'd be happy. You could pay off those debts, and life would be great. Then you start making $80,000 a year. But only if you made 100000 Then you'd be set. Life would be perfect. You could upgrade the house, maybe upgrade the cars. But when we get what we want, or what we thought, we thought we wanted, it can bring problems of its own. Money can be an idol, an idol that demands more and more sacrifice. The love of money constantly pushes a vision of happiness that will always just be a little further out, just beyond our reach at that moment. And so we're never content. Now, I know that money matters. No one thinks that it doesn't. Nobody really thinks that. But the problems start when we think that it is the only thing that matters or that it matters the most. And that it alone can make us happy and solve our problems. We've bought into the BS vision, the idolatry that can never lead to happiness. Now, on the other end of the building in my office, right above my, my light switch in the office, I have a little plaque. It was actually given to me by Jonathan's mom. And it has a favorite scripture verse of mine on it. For I, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. It sounds so nice. You know, it's one of those little, those little Bible verses that you place on the wall and it's, you know, it kind of makes you feel good because God has this vision and this plan for my prosperity to make me feel good. But here's the rest of it that they don't put on the plaque. Listen closely. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile." 
It all sounds good until you realize that you got sent into exile and that you've been living in despair. God is speaking to people. This little quote that we put on plaques, God is speaking to people who will never see prosperity. Not in their life. Those Israelites that the prophet is speaking to are going to have to endure 70 years of living as displaced people, as refugees in captivity in Babylon, largely due to bad decisions they made. That plaque is a reminder to me that my happiness, our happiness, our prosperity, It's not about how we feel in the moment. Happiness is a choice to trust that we can be, we can be content in all circumstances with the hope that our God of resurrecting grace goes with us always and that there is always hope. Jonathan, I love Jonathan. His story isn't over. Not by a long shot. And neither is yours. For as long as you draw breath, and I believe even beyond that, there is hope. That the happiness that God intends is not some BS vision, but true happiness comes from persevering and overcoming the challenges that we face in this life. And we're going to talk more about that next week. But for now, will you pray with me? Holy Spirit, Spirit of Christ, give me a vision of true happiness. Give me the courage to call the false idols that enslave my soul, to call them that the BS that they are, Share that wisdom with me and give strength in the middle of the struggle. Amen. As we 